We are on. How's everyone doing? Look at you all. Where were you at six o'clock? <laughs> Public service announcement. Church starts at six. <laughs> Sounds like whale song. Is there a um? Do we have a ah? Come on. Ah, so I got blasted last night, <laughs> for those of you who saw. Um, I have, I went to the toilet after, I'll tell you later, I'll share the testimony. This is really, should I use that? Oh, that sounds bad. Okay, so um, during ministry time, I went up and I, I got blasted. I'll, I'll share that testimony later. But afterwards, I went to the toilet and you know when you do that double take of yourself in the mirror? I did like a quadruple take. I was like... <laughs> and I looked, and I thought I was wearing eye makeup. And I looked at my eyelids. It's all closed full. I'll tell you why later. Um, <laughs> just sit down. It's going to be okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I looked at my eyes, and I honestly thought I was wearing eyeshadow. And... Um, it turns out that I was manifesting so hard that I burst all the blood vessels in my eyelids. <laughs> so that's kind of set. That's a new one for me. You know, you haven't really met with the Lord until you've burst all the blood vessels in your eyelids. So that was, uh, that was good fun. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what was going on there later. So I want to speak this evening on... Is this really... Should I use the handheld? Yeah. I'll use the handheld. You don't get any of the Britney actions now. Look at that. So, um, <clears throat> speaking this evening on fulfilling your mandate. And uh, I want to just kind of unpack that a little bit. We're going to, um, if you want to grab your Bibles, we're going to start in 1 Kings. We'll go there in a minute. Oh, sorry, 2 Kings. 2 Kings 2. We've got so many Americans joining the church now, and they're, they're having a, yeah, I know, right? They're, they're having a, for the most part, they've been a really positive influence on our church, but there's one area which I'm really not enjoying, which is I'm picking up all of these Americanisms, which is really genuinely upsetting. My English teacher probably is like, she's just, when it happens, she's probably somewhere, she's like, something terrible has just happened. But the one that I've picked up, which is really frustrating me, is I've gone from calling it two kings to second kings. What's that all about? But then I was, uh, I was preaching a while back from like, I think it was like 2 Kings 22. And for some reason, instead of 2 Kings 22, I said 2 Kings 2nd. And I was just like, what is that? That's not a real thing. That was crazy. But for the most part, we're loving the Americans, so it's all good. So um, other thing I just want to do before I start, I just want to honor Rob Cates. He is so prophetic he came up to me, uh, I was just outside during the worship, and he came up and he, he had this amazing prophetic word for me. But he just said, I just saw you, um, and I, I just saw this um, three-pronged Nerf boomerang. Have you seen those things? Like the little Nerf, they're like foam boomerangs. And, he started, and I just stopped him. I was like, can you just say that again? He said, I saw you with this three-pronged Nerf boomerang. I was like, were you here at the morning service this morning? He was like, no, Why? This morning, I kid you not, I was stood out just before the service playing with one of the kids who'd come, and I was throwing a three-pronged Nerf boomerang. <laughs> I was like, man, okay, I'm going to listen to this word now. Because <laughs> normally I would just, no, I'm kidding. But, you know, <laughs> it's, so, it's so amazing, and I, I want to really encourage you. We're, we're really trying to push the envelope in terms of our prophetic, and in, in terms of specificity, in terms of the, the detail of the word. And, and over the conference, we were releasing words of knowledge, and, and we just really want to encourage you to, 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 to stretch yourself, to push yourself, because it was an amazing word. He could have just delivered the word, but the fact that he said the three-pronged foam Nerf boomerang Really, who knows that got my attention, right? So I just want to encourage you. Let's just be pushing in for some really specific prophetic words, really specific words of knowledge. Is that cool? Okay, so I want to talk about fulfilling your mandate. And um, there's four areas I want to cover this evening. The first is I want to cover our identity. The second is I want to cover our calling. The third is I want to cover our place within the body of Christ. And the fourth is we're going to cover the anointing, okay? But far be it from me to teach on something that isn't, 
uh, four things of the same letter. So instead of identity, calling, place in the body and anointing, I've come up with a great acronym for you. Four M's. So the acronym is mmm. <laughs> so turn to your neighbor and go mmm. <laughs> so I want to look at the man. I want to look at the mission. I want to look at the mandate. And I want to look at the mantle. Okay? So say that together. Man. man. Mission. mission. Mandate. mandate. Mantle. Okay, and I'm just going to define those really quickly just so we're on the same page because uh, sometimes with semantics we can kind of, we can have different understandings of the same word. We had an interesting meeting today where we actually realized that, you know, the words we use are really important. Um, and so by man, I don't mean men in terms of masculine, so girls, you can chill out. Just turn to your neighbor and go, chill out. <laughs> I don't mean man as in the masculine, I mean man as in mankind. So when I say man, I mean all of us, Yeah. Um, Stu always says that, you know, you girls have to put up with being sons for 70, 80, 90 years, but us boys are going to have to be the bride of Christ for all eternity. So just <laughs> calm down, okay? It's okay. So man, what I mean by man is mankind. Uh, the mission, I'm talking about the corporate calling of the entire body of Christ, the corporate calling of every Christian. I'm going to unpack that a little bit as we go. The mandate. The mandate is not me and Stu going for a romantic meal, okay? That's not what I mean by mandate. What I mean by, although that sounds fun, we should do that sometime. That'd be awesome. What I mean by mandate is, as opposed to the corporate calling of the body of Christ, I mean, by mandate, I mean specific calling for you personally. So something that's a specific thing for you to do that God gives you to do. And the mantle is the covering. It's the office. It's the position, okay? Everyone cool with that? So, quick recap, I've spoken before on um, character calling and capability, and I just wanted to preface the talk just by doing literally a 30-second, probably not 30-second, let's be honest, it's me, but character calling and capability, and and when I teach on this, I talk about how so often in the church, we, we start with our capabilities, and we allow them to define our calling, and from that, we find our character, and that's how a lot of us do it, and actually, I would propose to you that that's a really dangerous thing to do. Why? Because if you define your identity by what you can do and what you're called to do, then if that changes, then you lose your identity. I was having a really interesting chat with someone at the conference, and we were talking about how, you know, if you want to find yourself, if you want to figure out who you are, you can't do that based on your calling, because callings change. Did you know that? Some, you know, if something for life is more likely to be an identity than a calling, because callings can be seasonal, callings can be situational, callings can be circumstantial, okay? There was a season where I was called to be worship pastor at Catch the Fire London. That season came to an end, and then you guys got an, up- an upgrade with Matt and Kate, who appear to have fallen out and are not sat together. <laughs> so something we need to resolve. <laughs> what did you do, Matt? What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, your, your, your calling can be seasonal, your, your calling can be situational. You know, you can find yourself in a situation and there's a calling for you in that situation. Or your calling can be circumstantial. Your calling can just be something that you do because you find yourself in a certain place or a situation or a circumstance arises. If you get your character, your identity, from your calling or from your capabilities, when things change, you lose who you are. And I would propose to you that really, first and foremost, what we need to do is find out who we are in God your identity, what is your character in God. And from your character, you can then understand your calling. And from your calling, the the capabilities can complement that, okay? So an example would be, oh, you can sing and you're really good at playing guitar, so probably your calling is to be a worship leader, and then you find your identity in that. And the trouble is when you find your identity in being a worship leader, if you stop being a worship leader, then you've lost your identity. And there's too many people in the body of Christ who find their identity, find their worth, find their value from what it is they do instead of who they are. And so why don't you even just stop for a second and just close your eyes and just ask Holy Spirit to show you if there's any way, any place where you somehow get your sense of being, your sense of worth, your sense of value, your sense of identity from something that you do. Just repent for that. Just ask God, just even in this moment, to affirm your identity. Not what do you do, but who are you? I would have got that if I was using the head mic. (laughs) Okay, we now have video podcasts. How cool is that? I suddenly realized that now, when everyone had their eyes closed, I was 
being mean to Alistair, and then I realized the video was running. So I really hope all the people on the podcast shut their eyes at that time as well. <laughs> we just have to instigate a rule. If you're watching the podcast, you've got to do like the shutting your eyes thing. You were being naughty, so I just thought I'd call you out. Okay, so let's look at man first of all. So character. Um, another word for character is mark on the soul. You know, God tests the heart. Did you know that? God tests our heart. He tests our character. He gives us opportunities to succeed. He gives us opportunities to show what he's put in us. He tests the heart. You know who you are when you understand whose you are. Identity and value and worth, it comes from the Father. Um, Stu was preaching at the conference out of Ephesians 3, I think it is. For this reason, I bow my knee before the Father in heaven from whom the whole, of, the whole family of heaven and earth derives its name. The, the role of a father is to give identity. And, and we can only understand who we are. We can only understand our identity when we have the revelation of who he is. If you want to know who you are, you've got to find out whose you are. And when you understand that you're his, that's where you get your place of identity. A fully infinite God, completely infinite. There's no end to his nature, to his character, and each of us is made in the image of God. Each of us has something completely unique to express of the heart and the nature and the character of God. Why don't you just turn to your neighbor and say, thank you. And what you're thanking them for, what you're thanking them for is because they are on a journey, they're committed to a journey of becoming more like who God made them to be. Did you know that we need to become who we were born to be, not who we were raised to be. Did everyone hear that? We're called to be who we were born to be, not who we were raised to be. And when you understand the nature and the character of God, you start to get transformed into his image. And so the key of identity, the key of understanding who you are, first and foremost, revelation of the Father from whom the whole family derives its name. That's why in the natural you take your father's name, because names are about identity, and in the olden days, the name would have given you an, an insight into what the family did. The smith would have been the blacksmith in the, in the village. And so understanding who he is enables us to understand who we are. That's the man. That's the character, the mark on the soul, the mission, the corporate mission. I, I speak often about you know, your individual calling and your corporate calling. Each and every one of you has an individual mission that God has made for your life. But we have a corporate mission uh, that essentially this is the body of Christ, this is the church, there's a mission for the church to do and we're going to look at the Great Commission in a minute and, and define that. I would define a mission as an assignment given to a group, so that would be the church of Christ, the body of Christ. We have a mission as the body of Christ to fulfill on this earth before Jesus comes back. Anyone agree? The distinction between a mission and a mandate is a mandate is much more localized. It's much more focused. The mission is the big corporate mission. I, 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 did a wonderful, I did something very unlike me. I did a wonderful PowerPoint. Had it all sorted out. And then in the shower this morning, God changed the talk. So you're not getting your PowerPoint now. Sorry. How it was pretty as well. I had like little colors and everything. I had a little pointer that I was going to It was glorious. We'll do that another day maybe. But the mandate, do you know Catch the Fire London has a mandate? Catch the Fire London has been given a mandate by God. We are part of the body of Christ, and we're working towards that, that mission for the whole body. But within, within our, our, our corporate gathering as a, as a church family, we have a mandate. You have a mandate. Each and every one of you has a mandate from God. A, a mandate I've defined here as an official order to do something. Okay, so think of it, an, an analogy I was thinking about earlier is, you know, a soldier in the army. You know, the, 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 the corporate mission for the army is to do whatever the government needs it to do, right? Whether that's providing safety, whether that's going to war specific. You know, the, the general calling of the, the soldier as, as he pertains to the whole army is to do the will of the government, to provide protection and security. But within that, there's a mandate for each unit, a mandate for each battalion, a mandate for each soldier even. You know, a soldier in a squad has a role. Soldier first... You know, rifleman first, radio man second. Yeah, and, um, Alastair and I and Nathan are big. We're getting through um, Band of Brothers. Has anyone ever seen Band of Brothers? And there's this amazing scene um, where they've just dropped in on D-Day. And there's a radio man for one of the signal groups. And he's lost his radio. And he's, he's getting himself all worked up because that's his thing. He's the radio man. And there's a big plan that's, you know, relying on him to be the radio man. And the captain says, you know, I, I, would, I would say that you're a rifleman first, radio man second, you know. And so understanding that the, the soldier, the army has a, a, a big corporate mission. But within that, there's a, there's a set separate, more specific mandate and focus for that soldier. And then the mantle, the role or responsibility that passes from one person to another. Okay, that's how we would define a mantle. And so in the Old Testament, I'm just, it's a bit teaching now, don't worry, we're going to get into some more of the kind of the, the Bible uh, stuff in a minute, but I just wanted to define some terms. In the Old Testament, 
the mantle stays with the mission, not the man. Okay, so the mantle is the responsibility, the role. So we're going to look in a minute at two kings, Elijah and Elisha, and we're going to talk. You know, we're going to look at the story of the, the mantle that got passed from Elijah to Elisha. Okay, but the mantle in the Old Testament it stayed with the mission, not with the man. Okay, but in the New Testament, the mantle stays with the man for the mission, and that's what I want to look at tonight: fulfilling our mandate as a as a as a as an individual Christian and as the body of Christ, understanding that when the the mantle comes on us. We're equipped to fulfill the mandate for the mission. Does that make sense? It's a lot of M's, isn't it? Man gets given the mantle to help him fulfill the mandate to be on the mission. Yeah, that's the journey we're going through. So say with me, man, mantle, mandate, mission. Turn to your neighbor going, hmm. <laughs> Feels good, doesn't it? Right, let's go to two kings. Where's my Bible? Gosh, it's going to be one of those evenings. Yeah, second king, second second. <laughs> Don't know if I can get this Americanism thing cast out of me or not, but we'll have a look at that later. Two Kings two, okay. <clears throat> what? <laughs> Video cast, oh gosh. <clears throat> Land the plane. 2 Kings 2, okay, so this is the story of Elijah being taken up to heaven, really familiar story, Um, I'm just going to paraphrase the first bit and then we'll get to what I want to look at, Um, uh, we've got Elisha following Elijah and Elisha keeps asking, uh, Elijah keeps asking Elisha, stay here, stay here, and the the general theme of what Elisha is doing is saying, no, I'm going to stay with you, I'm going to follow you, and the thing I just wanted to point out really quickly is we see straight away the character of the man, you know, first and foremost, Elisha is a son. We're going to look at the mantle that passed to him from Elijah. But first and foremost, he's a son. When you look at the calling of Elisha, he he says, you've become my father. And there's something in here that we need to see that before any of the prophetic stuff passed to him, you know, he was was a disciple, sure. But before he was a disciple, he was a son first. He left his mother and his father. And he went and, remember, he, you know, um, sacrificed the oxen and smashed up all the stuff. And he went to follow. And he, he gave his life to someone else. Do you know, there's something about finding your dream come true by giving up your dream to make someone else's dream come true there's something in the heart of the the son that wants to there's something in the heart of the father to see the son released but there's something in the heart of the son that says I want to serve the father and in that we see a, a you know a godly you know you look at Jesus and the father you know the the, the, the father saw Jesus released you know he he he, he empowered him and, and released him to do the work of the kingdom but all the time there was this deference that Jesus was saying you know I only do what I see the father doing I only say what I hear the father saying I must be about my father's business there's something in the heart of the father to release the son but there's something in the heart of the son to follow and serve the father so that's the context we have Elisha following Elijah and then we go over this is why the head mic's so good Gosh, okay. <laughs> That's worrying. So he's saying, you know, Elijah's saying, you know, wait here. Elijah's like, no, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you. Verse 9, when they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Uh, Elijah's already been told that he's going to be taken. Uh, they know it's going to happen. They just don't know when. He says, what can I do for you before I'm taken? <sighs> Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. Verse 11, as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire, and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. That sounds cool. Verse 12, Elisha saw this and cried out, my father, my father. The chariots and horsemen of Israel, and Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his clothes and tore them apart. He picked up the cloak that had, and this is a key word, he picked up the cloak that had fallen. You'll see why it's a key word in a minute for the big reveal. From Elijah, and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The mantle, in this, it's it's a physical... It's a physical thing that Elijah wore. Now, in the Old Testament, the, the mantle would have been symbolic of God's spirit on the prophet, okay? So they would have worn it as a, it's like a shawl or a kind of, you know, a pashmina or something like that. No? I don't know. Help me out, someone. Poncho, there we go. Pashmina. Gosh, where did that come from? Um, 
it's a, it's, it's a covering. It's, it's like a, a poncho. It's a, it's a, it's a shawl. It's like a, a blanket that they would have worn. And it would have symbolized, firstly, it would have symbolized that they held an office, okay? The difference between being prophetic and being a prophet. The difference between the practice of prophecy and the office of prophecy, okay? So that would have been one of the, the reasons they would have worn it. But it also symbolized the Spirit of God on them. Because remember, in the Old Covenant, the Spirit wasn't freely given. It, it came for specific purposes of specific callings. It would have been a covering. Mantle. It's where we get manta ray. Did you know that? Because that, you know, that, that they look a bit like a shawl, don't they? I know, right? Interesting. It's also where we get mantle piece, which I thought was really interesting. The covering for the fire. Oh, I know, right? Yeah, took a few of you a couple of seconds longer. We won't judge you, it's fine. Let's not look at the fact that you were late and just celebrate the fact that you came at all. <laughs> it's a covering, it's a blanket. It's interesting to me, um, my little cousin has a little blanket, it's a, a comfort blanket, and he calls it the comforter. That's what they're called, aren't they? The little, the little blankets, it's a comforter. And, and it's a blanket that he wears, and I love that, that it was symbolic of the Holy Spirit, and my little nephew calls it the comforter. I think that's great. It signifies God's covering. It signifies God's endorsement. And we see the cloak fall, okay? And I pointed out that specific word, if you remember, fall, okay? This is a prophetic picture. Let's go to Matthew 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John rebuke you for having a... Don't you mind? <laughs> Matthew 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. And in the Old Testament, how that mantle was symbolic of the covering. It was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And I love that picture that we have in two kings of the mantle falling on Elisha. The mantle fell and he picked it up and put it on. And in the New Testament, we see that same prophetic foreshadow where Jesus is being released into his office. Okay, he's being released into his ministry, the thing that he was uh, ordained by God to do, and we see the Holy Spirit falling on him, and it's that same idea. Heaven was opened. Do you know the word for heaven is opened is ripped? It's the same word that's used when the, the veil is torn in the temple. And so often, it, I've said this before, but for those of you who haven't heard it, I, just, I always love talking about this because it really helped me in changing my mindset, changing my understanding and the way I think. You know, you've got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? And you've got to have the way you think about things change. And then that, the way you think about things affects how you do things because as a man thinks... So he is, okay? So this really helped me because I used to have this idea that whenever Holy Spirit was coming, he was going to be sent. And I used to, who's, who's prayed that prayer? Oh God, open up the heavens. You prayed that prayer? Am I just the only person who's prayed that prayer? Come on, that's a great prayer. Who's prayed that prayer? Who isn't going to raise their hand no matter what I ask? Okay, right. So, and so for me, I always used to think of this idea of, you know, when I was asking God to send his spirit um, or, or, you know, and, or asking God to come, asking God to manifest his presence, I would always have this idea that somehow the heavens had to open up first and then God would send his spirit or Holy Spirit would come. But actually, that's not what it says here at all. You know, if God was going to close the heavens back up, he probably would have cut the heavens open. But he didn't. He ripped the heavens open. Do you think that when the, the, the veil was torn in the temple, it was ripped in such a way that it could have ever been put back together? No. The way that veil was ripped was to show that was never meant to be put back together. That's the same word as when God opened up the heavens. He ripped open the heavens for Holy Spirit to descend. Because what happened at that point was Holy Spirit descended and he was never going back up again. And that's the point. That's, that's what helps me think differently. You know, oh God, open up the heavens. No, 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 no. They're already open. He's already here. Why don't you just hold out your hands? And just receive the experiential truth that he's already here. Open up the heavens. Rain down, God. Send your fire, God. I've always wondered if those two cancel each other out, but just a thought. <laughs> but the, the heavens are violently ripped open. The Holy Spirit falls. The Holy Spirit is the mantle in this instance. We've got the man, Jesus, full of character. He grew in stature and favor with God and with man, okay? 
never sinned. We used to say that, um, you know, Jesus hadn't done anything at the point of his baptism. And then uh, a dear, dear friend of the house, Paul Dancy, uh, lovingly rebuked Stu and I on it. And he was like, actually, that's not entirely true. And we were like, really? You know, all of his miracles start after the Holy Spirit falls on him. And he said, yeah, 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 but he lived 30 years of sinless life. <laughs> How you doing with that one? <laughs> Interesting to me as well that he managed to do that without the empowerment. I mean, I know the Spirit was with him, but the, anyway, let's go. In, let's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a preach for another day. Jesus the man, full of character, full of humility, perfection. Amen. Understands the wider mission, the wider mission, the, the great commission, as we're going to look at in a minute. He understood the wider mission. He had a specific mandate, and he received the mantle. Old Testament, mantle stays with the mission, not with the man. New Testament, mantle falls on the man for the mission. So it's a shift of the model. Put it another way, Holy Spirit, Old Testament, Holy Spirit on you. New Testament, Holy Spirit on you, Holy Spirit in you. Uh, I heard someone say once, um, he's on you. He's in you for you, and he's on you for everyone else. Holy Spirit comes down. Jesus propelled into his ministry, into his mandate. All the miracles begin. The mandate within the wider mission. Let's go to Acts 2. It's Pentecost Sunday. Yeah, I know. Catch the fire. We're like, well, every Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Some of you could do with Pentecost Monday. That's my thought. Um, (laughs) Sailor, yeah. (laughs) All all the staff who work on a Monday are like, is it me? (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, the problem's everyone else, not me. Don't worry. Pentecost Sunday. Matthew Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Just stay in Acts 2. I'm going to read you Matthew 28 quickly. Really, really well-known verse. Verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Sorry, that was me doubting Thomas. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Okay, So that's what Jesus has left with his disciples as the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Did you know the wider mission of the church is too big for one person? That's why it's called the Great Co-Mission. Because we're all in it together. It's going to take everyone being who they're called to be to see the Great Commission fulfilled, okay? The wider... Here's a potentially controversial statement. You'll find out if the rest of the leadership agree with me if it stays on the podcast. The... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah thank god we're not live streaming yet so it's interesting to me that jesus was part of the great commission he started something that we're called to finish okay jesus was part of the great commission it's interesting to me that the greater works i believe is is pertaining to the fact that the the wider mission was bigger than even the ministry of Jesus, not bigger than Jesus in and of himself. Obviously, he's the great I am. He's the first. He's the last. He's the Alpha, the Omega. But for the man, Jesus, do you know it would have been really easy for Jesus to just fulfill the Great Commission? He was limitless through the power of God, okay? But God doesn't choose to do it all himself. He chooses to partner with us. That's why we're co-laborers. Would have been really easy for Jesus to just do it all himself. Yet he chose to give the great commission, okay? And I believe that's part of the greater works. I believe there's a sphere of the, the, the ministry of Jesus that is smaller than the great commission. Does that make sense? Because I believe there's something in the heart of God that wants to see us go bigger and better and further. That's why he said you will do greater things, right? Did he mean greater in number? Did he mean greater in magnitude? I don't really care. I'll take either. M- more of the same that he did or really different stuff. Who would be happy with just more, whether it's more in magnitude or more in number? The Great Commission, okay, that's the context for what we're about to read in Acts 2. Let's just finish up uh, 
chapter 1, just so you get the context. Um, so this is um, the disciples uh, looking for a replacement for Judas. Um, so verse uh, 23, so they proposed two men, Joseph called uh, Barsabbas, also known as Justus. Interesting, that actually sounds quite like Judas, doesn't it? Maybe that's why they went with uh, Matthias. <laughs> Presents a bit of a PR problem, doesn't it? <laughs> Did you say Judas? No, Justice. Are you Judas? No, Justice. <laughs> Do you know what? Let's just go with Matthias. That's going to save a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you've chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go to where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. Chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, interestingly, just I'm going to throw this out as a little aside. So 40 days since Jesus rose from the dead, right? 10 days roughly after he ascended. The, the Pentecost fell on a, 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 a ceremony, a Jewish ceremony that celebrated the law. And I love here that we see that that was the day God chose to release his spirit, to see the Great Commission be started. On the day where historically they would have been thinking about the law, we see the, the, the grace fueled action of releasing the Holy Spirit, the comforter to come and equip the church for the works of the kingdom, to reveal the nature of Christ. I love that. I love that. The rest of you are like, yeah, whatever, okay. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, unity. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. I've been in a few of those prayer meetings. And filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. Tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on them. Okay? So Holy Spirit falls, tongues of fire. One flame, many expressions, Okay? Tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. I think it's really interesting there that God was just showing us something. That in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came on you. And that was it. And that's how Holy Spirit first fell on Pentecost. The tongues of fire came on them and then filled them. I think that's something, That's to me, that that speaks of God just saying, you know, so often Jesus said, you've heard it said, now I say to you. And I love that kind of prophetic picture of almost like, this isn't doctrine, don't build your life on this, but it's just interesting to me. Holy Spirit came on them, then Holy Spirit filled them. Why don't you just experience the difference right now? You know, so often we hear people on outreach saying, that was Jesus on the outside, do you want Jesus on the inside? Holy Spirit on you, the anointing, the empowering. Holy Spirit in you, the comforter. He's in you for you. He's on you for them. Tongues of fire on them. All of them were filled. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, oh sorry, I missed a bit. The Holy Spirit filled them and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all of these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? I love that. You know, when the Holy Spirit manifests, he meets each person where they're at. How is it we hear them in our own native language? And then a bunch of things I'm not even going to try and pronounce, because that's just crazy. Verse 12, uh, sorry, end of verse 11. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. When was the last time someone made fun of you because of your faith? I was really encouraged on the noise project because we got mocked for being Christians. And I turned to my friend who was sitting next to me. I was like, this is great. The last time I was mocked for being a Christian was secondary school. (laughs) This is really good. There's a good litmus test. When was the last time you were mocked for being a Christian? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then it goes on to say, you know, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Not just the people who are anointed for the specific role, like in the Old Testament. All people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. (laughs) That's upsetting. 
I tend to dream more dreams than I see visions. That must mean that I'm, a, I'm an old man. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so we see the men, the disciples, the men of character, the men of lowly stature. You know, these weren't learned theologians. These were fishermen and tax collectors. They were rough and ready. They, they, they had a lot of issues, you know. I get so encouraged reading about the disciples. It gives me a lot of hope. Because <coughs> they were pretty dozy at times. Yet they were men of character because they saw something in Jesus and they followed him. They recognized he was the Messiah. Where would we go? You have the words of life. Men of character who understood the great mission of the church of Christ, received the mandate from Jesus himself. And then in that moment in Acts 2, Pentecost Sunday, which we celebrate today, they received the mantle. The mantle, the comforter. The empowerment to do the mandate within the mission. Not getting your identity from the mission, but getting your identity first and foremost. Understanding the great co-mission I got busted last night, and I went up to Clo. This is my bit where I get a little bit tearful. I, <laughs> I'd been prepping and preparing this, so obviously it was in my mind, and God was just speaking to me in that moment about receiving the mantle, receiving the empowerment to, to fulfill the mandate so I can be on the mission. And I understand my identity in Christ. I really do. I'm genuinely quite a secure person. You have to be when you're this hairy, okay? And, and, and I, I'm secure about myself, okay? I've got a great figure. I'm easygoing, you know? And, and um, <laughs> I've got, I'm in great shape. <laughs> Rounds of shape, right? <laughs> Lol. I understand my identity in Christ, you know? I, I understand that. I understand my identity... I am, therefore I do, not I do, therefore I am. I'm not working for approval, I'm working from approval. I'm securing my identity. I've caught the vision for the mission that God has given to the, to the body of Christ. I've given my life to this mission. Not because I'm working for the church, but because I'm a Christian. You're all mini anointed ones, okay? I used to say, if you take the Christ out of Christian, you're just left with Ian. But now I have a really good friend called Ian at church, so I'm not allowed to say that anymore. <laughs> Because actually being left with Ian is a great option. <laughs> but before Ian was in the church, that's what I used to say. I, I understand my identity. I, I, I understand that I'm on mission, family on mission. There's a, there's a mission, the body of Christ, that's something that we're all called to. I understand my mandate within that. My particular specific orders that God has given me. You know, we've got the standing orders. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. Release those in oppression, you know, preach the good news, all of those kind of things. The Great Commission. I know that he's with me on that Great Commission, and I know we're all part of that, but I understand the Great Commission is bigger than any one man. That's why we don't believe in one-man ministry. What I was missing, I believe, in that moment last night was a revelation of the mantle to accomplish the mandate. And it was interesting because I'm, I'm so grateful to God for his grace that he gave me that revelation last night so I could get it sorted before suddenly realizing as I was stood up here that I didn't have it. <laughs> you know, Abby's got a great uncle, I think it was, that got saved in one of his own sermons. <laughs> True story. <laughs> I mean, great, great that that happened. Got a question the 20 years prior to that, but whatever, that's fine. <laughs> Getting saved in your own sermon. Gosh, you imagine giving an altar call and being the first one up there. <laughs> Everyone's like, well, this is awkward. <laughs> Whenever God gives you a new mandate, you need a fresh mantle. Anytime your mandate changes, and it will change. Why? Because calling is a seasonal, situational, and circumstantial. Your calling isn't going to stay the same. Your, your calling as a Christian is elect. That's it. You're, you're called to, to be Christ, okay? The, the Great Commission, there's no getting away from that. And that's all of us doing that, okay? We're not going to see the Great Commission fulfilled unless we all step into our own little mini commissions that God's giving us. My, my mandate had changed. My mantle hadn't caught up with that. And that's what I received last night. And that's a game changer. I don't know if you saw me walking around like the happiest guy in the room. Humanly speaking, the kind of day I've had, I should not be looking as happy as I'm looking. 
my wife and two darling children in another country. I'm lonely. I'm kind of feeling the, had a stressful day. I walk in here. I'm just like on cloud nine. Seriously. <laughs> Something's changed. Something changed in me last night. I'm now wearing eye makeup. It's fantastic. <laughs> Come and look afterwards. It's genuinely great. That's like, I just, I think I've raised the bar for encounter. That'll be like, oh, I really met with God. Really? Show me your eyes. Nah, you didn't meet with God. <laughs> you thought you met with God. No, no bleeding. You didn't meet with God. It was intense, man. And God was really doing something. And I got my jacket and I, I went up to Chloe and I felt like a ripe banana in front of everyone. And I went up and I said, I want you to impart to me. I, I recognize God has just challenged me in this moment that my mandate has shifted and my mantle hasn't yet caught up. Holy Spirit is, is on me and in me, but where God appoints, God anoints. And when he appoints you to a new season, a new calling, there has to be a fresh anointing for that. That's why when people get appointed to a new position, we anoint them. That's why we cover them in oil, just in case you're wondering, you know, just if you thought they had to be like slippery for their job or something like that. That's not why we do it. It's symbolic. It's, it's that Psalm 133 where, where Aaron, the high priest, it's the anointing that, that starts on the head. Who is Christ? He's the head of all things. And the anointing, the, the, the oil, that's what it's representing. It flows down from the head. Jesus is the anointed one, okay? First and foremost, Jesus is the anointed one. You're the little anointed ones. When he is the head, it says in, in Psalm 133, and I've preached on this before, the oil flows down onto the beard, onto the collar, onto the robes. There's a flow of anointing that happens. But the purpose of anointing in the Old Testament was when someone was appointed, they were anointed, okay? David was appointed as king, like anointed, I think, three different times. It, you know, it took a while for him to become the king. When, when, when God appoints you, God anoints you. But when your mandate in the new covenant, you've received the Holy Spirit, okay? He's given without measure, okay? But no one's questioning that. But I believe there's something that happens when you enter into a new season, a new calling, that there has to be the mantle to, to match that. Does that make sense? It's not saying like, I believe you can still do what God's called you to do, but it's just going to be harder work. Think of Holy Spirit like greasing the skids, Yeah. You can fight through and kind of probably do it without the full measure of the anointing. Or you can just let God equip you and empower you for what he's already called you to do. Which, which sounds like an easier job. <laughs> you want an illustration? Let's do an illustration. Okay. I haven't done an illustration for a while, have I? I think the last time I did an illustration, I shot sweets at someone through a sling, so that was awesome. <laughs> okay, so Andrew and Ashley, why don't you come up here? Oh, Andrew and Ashley. Why do birds suddenly appear? We might need to just move these back a little bit, these uh, barriers. Okay, these guys are dating. Everyone say, ah. Oh. Thankfully, we kind of got through that kind of first little bit of honeymoon season where they're all just like, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're like in the office you hang up no you hang up no you hang up I'm like I'll hang up flipping <laughs> calm it down alright <laughs> I love you more yeah he probably does okay bye <laughs> bang <laughs> love after marriage gosh okay so this is a man of character he is a man of character he is a man of character did you know that you're flipping awesome okay enough of that right so man of character okay he understands he's a man he's a great big man okay man of character okay and uh the the wider mission that he's on uh, don't i mean don't extrapolate this too far because the whole analogy will fall apart just let's just take it in the in the in the, the fun in which it's intended visual representation of what happens when you understand that a fresh mandate requires a fresh mantle okay now you're glad it all begins with them right Okay, so he's a man, he's a character. Part of his identity, okay, is he, um, come on, let's probably should have planned this beforehand. Part of his identity, not what he's called to do, but his identity is that he is someone who will fight for the underdog. Someone who will fight for the underdog. Someone who, it's, it's not just what God's called him to do, that's part of who he is. That's something that he carries, that's part of his identity is. He will speak for those who have no voice. He will stand in the gap. He will fight for you because that's who God's made him to be. Just in the same way that Stu's primary message is identity and sonship. That's, he does that, but that's who he is as well. Yeah, God, isn't, God doesn't just love, he is love. God doesn't just provide, he is provider, okay? And so your calling will often flow out of your identity, but not the other way around. Does that make sense? So he's a, he's a rescuer. He's a, come on, give us some, yeah, come on, he's got some, he's got some guns, he's got some chops. And um, here is a woman who is, um, you could be our damsel in distress. Can you do a damsel in distress? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so come and stand over here. 
Gosh, I tell you what, you just can't get the staff these days, can you? Okay, and then I need someone to be the, someone to be the enemy. Who can be the enemy? Alistair. Hello. Gosh. Come on, Jason. Yeah. Everyone say, eh, no, don't. <laughs> okay, so Jason, for the purposes of today, is going to be playing the role of the enemy. Everyone say, boo. Don't worry, he's like a lion. He's not actually a lion. He's had his teeth removed. Remember that preach from the other week? Okay, and he has the, he has the damsel in distress in captivity. Okay, everyone say, boo. <laughs> so the character... Don't actually hit him because we're not covered by insurance for that. Okay. You can do what you like off the school grounds, but in here, don't hit him. Um, <clears throat> what's the character? Yeah, the, the rescuer, the, 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 the fighter, he's going to stand in the gap, okay? The wider mission is to set the captives free, okay? That's part of the great commission, okay? But his specific mandate in this season, God is giving him a calling in this season to see Ashley get her breakthrough, okay? Does that make sense? Now, he can... He's just like, let me at him. Can you, can, you do some, can you do some captivity type stuff? Just kind of like, kind of stand like you're, you're blocking. Okay, okay. Can I just explain to you the, the relationship between actor and director? <laughs> if you want your paycheck, you'll do what you're told, okay? Right, so just put your, put your arms out like this, okay? So that's it, okay. So Andrew in this, in this moment, come and just stand here. There's, there's the character, which is rescuer, the guy who's going to stand in the gap, the guy who's going to speak for those who have no voice. The advocate, you know, that's part of the nature and character of Jesus. One of the roles of Jesus is that he is standing in the presence of the Father, making intercession on your behalf. Did you know that? He ever lives and breathes to make intercession for you. So he's taken on the nature, the whole, the family in heaven from whom we derive our name, okay? The name means nature, character. Part of the nature of Christ, part of the nature of God that Andrew is exhibiting when he's being who God's called him to be is that advocate, is that intercessor, is that, that stand beside, okay? Part of the role of Holy Spirit as well. Now, the mission, the wider mission is that we want to see people who are in captivity set free, don't we? What do the rest of you want? You're like, no, keep them in captivity. Of course, we want to see, we want to see people who are oppressed. We want to see people in captivity set free, don't we, right? Come on, amen. <laughs> yeah, maybe if it's Pentecost Sunday, not Pentecost Monday for sure. <laughs> there, there's, there's, a, there's something in the wider mission of the body of Christ that wants to see captives set free. But specifically, the mandate that he's been given in this season, in this situation, or in this circumstance the mandate he's been given is to, now we don't, this is where the kind of analogy falls apart a little bit. We don't fight the principalities and powers. We let God fight on our behalf. But sometimes we're called to come against the works of darkness or the results of darkness. We're called to come against the kingdom of darkness. Now, we don't believe in kind of fighting demons and fighting devils. God does that, okay? God rebukes them on our behalf. Don't extrapolate this too much, okay? Because it you know, starts to fall apart. <laughs> so, he can choose to do it. He has stepped into a new mandate. He's stepped into a new season, a new calling. He can, if he wants to, choose to, to just go all guns blazing and to try and do it without, yeah, I know, try and do it without the mantle, okay? Alternatively, he can recognize he's come into a new season, into a new mandate. He wants to fulfill his mandate, therefore he understands he needs to receive a fresh mantle. So why don't you just receive that fresh mantle? That's the anointing just going on him, okay? But you need to understand that when you, when you partner with the purposes and plans of the Father, you're never alone. So, Andrew, are you ready? Yeah. Andrew, are you ready? Go!
Ashley will be available to sign uh, autographs afterwards. So. <coughs> Fresh mandate, okay? Each and every one of you has a mandate directly from the king, okay? The orders come from the chief, right? Each and every one of you, you're, you're a Christian, so you're already part of the bigger mission. There's no changing that. Unless you believe you can lose your salvation, but let's not go there. That's definitely a sermon for another day. Within, <laughs> within the wider mission, each and every one of you has a mandate for the season that you're in, okay? And, and, and some of those things will be long callings. Other of those will be very short, kind of short callings. The point is when God releases a, a new mandate for you, he releases a fresh mantle for you. We've seen this corporately, haven't we? When we've felt that God has given us a specific mandate for a season and then we felt the anointing come for it. Now we could have, you know, when God, we could have decided a while back that, you know, God's always said Chalk Hill, okay? And we've kind of been doing stuff in Chalk Hill, but recently we felt it go up a gear and then we felt the anointing come. You know, you've had prophetic words over your life, Stu and Chloe, for a long time now about getting into government. You could have made that happen, which would have been disastrous. But when that new mandate came the new anointing came, and then you saw it just happen for you. And that's the kind of picture I want you to see is when, when we partner with heaven, when we understand that the anointing comes for the appointing, Andrew was appointed in that moment to, to, to be called to rescue Ashley, okay, to come against the work of the enemy. And he could have tried to do that on his own. He probably would have got the snot beaten out of him because Jason was looking pretty mean. But when the anointing comes, you get the whole of the backing of heaven's army. The whole host of heaven's army is going to be coming with you, shouting in tongues, shouting freedom, shouting Jesus, probably with Nerf guns as well. I'm sure that's what they issue uh, angels with, whatever. <laughs> the point is, and, and this is, I'm going to sit down now, just tell you a story to finish. I had some ministry on Monday. That was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, it wasn't that much fun. Um, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, like it's that feeling when you go to the dentist and you've got to have a filling and you know it's all going to be okay in the end, but it kind of really hurts in the process. And I, I, I recognize that my mandate recently has increased, okay? My, my job role's changed. My um, responsibility has increased. Authority has increased. And, and I recognize that my mantle hadn't caught up with that yet. Even though I was anointed here, that was symbolic, but in my heart, I hadn't received it. And um, I can't remember what, maybe you shouldn't say publicly, was there, what was it that came to a head that meant I got the call from Stu? <laughs> Sorry? Yes. So, <clears throat> I'd forgotten. Oh, gosh. The issue was my memory. <laughs> I'd forgotten that that was the problem. <laughs> One can't help escape the uh, irony. What is also ironic is um, Stu had arranged for me to come to his house to have some ministry with Caroline because we believe in inner healing. And um, we believe in inner healing? Yeah, okay, good. Just checking. It wasn't just me who has to go through that all the time. <laughs> Everyone else is like, oh, yeah, we're going for ministry, and they just go to Weatherspoons or something, but I'm the one who actually does the ministry. <laughs> ironically, Stu had booked in for me to have ministry because I kept forgetting things. Guess what I forgot? To put it in my diary. <laughs> So I get a call from Chloe at like one o'clock, she's like, where are you? I'm like, I'm in the office, where are you? Uh, you're meant to be here for ministry. <laughs> Where's, is Bliss here? Was it you that I had the meeting with? I'm so sorry, I had a meeting booked with Bliss and I had to call him. I'm like, yeah, sorry, we can't meet today because, you know, I've got to go and have some uh, ministry on my bad memory. <laughs> sorry, I forgot, see you, bye. <laughs> but we're seeing each other this week, so it's going to be awesome. Don't worry, it's all okay. Happy ending. <clears throat> the The... The, the manifestation of that issue was the, the memory thing. That was the, that was the fruit. The root was a feeling of overwhelm. And it was interesting. The, the, as we were going through the ministry, there were just so many things in my head, so many different pressures, so many different burdens that I was carrying. Come on, let's have a little... Oh, yeah, come on, let's, let's get into this. The, the manifestation was that I was forgetting things. The root was I was just thoroughly overwhelmed. I was... And... and, and this is where I might get a little tearful. The, 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 the painful memory that God healed was when I was really young, there was a guy in our church who ran his own business and became overwhelmed because a, a big supermarket opened in the town and, and profits were falling and he was struggling. That was his living. That was how he provided for his family. And he actually ended up getting to the point where he took his own life. And I, I, the, the memory was, <clears throat> um, ironically, Easter morning, uh, not Easter morning, Good Friday, when you do the walk of witness, did everyone, anyone used to do the walk of witness? 
in your town where you used to carry the cross around and, and, and it was the walk of witness. And, and we were there and it was, I can still remember, the, the, the big irony is I can remember it really clearly. It was Good Friday morning, so obviously you're, you're thinking about the death of Christ. And we started the walk of witness outside the supermarket that was the supermarket that had opened next to his greengrocers that had caused him to lose his business. Um, and I could, the, the memory was the vicar standing up who um, told us that he'd committed suicide the night before and he, he died. And it was, it was just this really traumatic thing. And I'm not saying this for a sob story. I'm saying this to illustrate what God did for me in my testimony. The fear was overwhelm leads to self-destruction. That was, the, that was the, 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 the sense of the ungodly belief, essentially. And I was living my life based on this, this fear that eventually you're going to get too overwhelmed and you're just going to self-destruct or you're going to implode or you're going to sabotage or something like that. And what Holy Spirit did for me in that time was he reminded me that when you're overwhelmed by the presence of God, nothing else will overwhelm you. You may have heard greater levels, greater devils. I would propose to you greater mandate, greater mantle. And so when you understand that you're called and appointed, you've got to go for the anointing. You've got to go for it because it's the empowering grace of God to be who God's called you to be and to do what God's called you to do. And so I want to be so overwhelmed by the presence of God that nothing else will ever overwhelm me. And I may still forget the odd thing, like what it was I was having ministry for. (laughs) Uh, What's the point? The point is when you are so overwhelmed by the presence of God... Nothing is going to overwhelm you. The task that the disciples had on Pentecost Sunday of the Great Commission, the Great Commission is frightening when you think about it. There's a lot of pressure on that because Jesus is coming back at some point. There's a finite scale to the Great Commission. There's a responsibility there that we all have to see Jesus get the full reward for his sufferings. But that's bigger than any one man. And that's quite an overwhelming task. Within your individual calling, that can feel overwhelming at times. Some of the prophetic words. If you're not overwhelmed by your prophetic words in the natural, you should probably get some new prophetic words. Go and see Zara. She'll sort you out. She'll tell you a bunch of stuff and you'll walk out and you'll be like, flipping heck. Okay. If you can, this is what you were saying the other night. If you can do the stuff that's been prophesied over you in your own strength, it's probably not a prophecy. But if you don't have the mantle for the mandate, you're going to get overwhelmed. You're going to fail. You're going to get frustrated you're going to try and do it in your own strength and ultimately you will fail if you are so overwhelmed by the presence of God in the anointing the mandate will probably just happen for you led by Dan and a crazy bunch of guys with nerf guns who are going to beat the snot out of Jason for you (laughs) is anyone here called to beat the snot out of Jason (laughs) we can help you with that these men are not drunk as you suppose What kind of drunk are you? That's what I want to finish with. Because we're going to have a fire time in a minute and we're all going to get drunk. It's going to be great. What kind of drunk are you? Because in my former life, when I used to drink, you know everyone's a a kind of drunk, aren't you? You've got like the aggressive drunk. You've got the person who thinks they're really funny when they're drunk. You've got the person who thinks they get the anointing for dance when they're drunk. (coughs) I believe alcohol is a perversion of the one drink that we're all given to drink, which is the drink of the spirit. These men are not drunk as you suppose. What must they have been doing for the people to think they were drunk? I believe that alcohol is a counterfeit for the true spirit. But the question is, what kind of drunk are you? Because when you drink, you do things you wouldn't normally do. (laughs) Yeah? (laughs) Who here has got a past and can relate to that? (laughs) When you drink in the natural, you do things you wouldn't normally do. When you drink in the spirit, you do things you wouldn't normally do. And that's the kind of church we want to be. We want to be a drinking church. We want to be a church that understands, first and foremost, we're we're a man. We're character. We want to understand we're here for a purpose and a mission. We want to understand that each of us has a mandate to fulfill within that wider mission. But most importantly, we want the mantle of the anointing of the presence of God to empower us and to equip us to be the people we've been called to be. And so, let us respond. Why don't you just hold out your hands? Spirit. I can feel him in me. I can feel him on me. We love your presence, Holy Spirit. 
And we never want to we never want to cultivate intimacy with you as a profession. We never want to seek your presence to do the stuff. We want to seek you first and foremost. Why don't you just repent if you've ever, and this will be probably everyone in the room, if you've asked for the presence of God because you want to prophesy well or you want to do something well. You want to do instead of be. First and foremost, the role of the Holy Spirit, the delight of the Holy Spirit is to reveal Christ to us. And if you see Christ, you can't help but fall more in love. Because to see him is to love him. But we're called first to be and we're called second to do. There's work to be done. And so I thought, (laughs) what could be better than one fire tunnel? Four fire tunnels. We are going to have four fire tunnels. We are going to have a fire tunnel led by Stu and some of the ministry team. And the first fire tunnel is a fire tunnel of identity. It's the man fire tunnel. (coughs) Where you're going to receive an impartation to greater revelation of your identity in Christ. And if you make it through the first fire tunnel, you can progress to the second fire tunnel, which is going to be ably led by Sarah and Sam as great exhibitors and carriers of the Great Commission. We love you guys. These guys do the Great Commission as their jobs and as their lifestyles. The second tunnel is an impartation for the greater works, for the work of the kingdom, to understand that we are here for a purpose. The church is meant to be doing the stuff of the Great Commission, the Great Commission, okay? Submission leads you to commission, the Great Commission. The third fire tunnel, if you make it, (coughs) is going to be led by Alistair, and that's going to be the tunnel of mandates, the mandate tunnel, where you're going to receive a fresh impartation for vision, for your calling, for your role, for the things that God is calling you to, either in this season, in this situation, or in this circumstance. What's God saying to you in this season? What's he calling you to do? And the fourth tunnel, if you make it that far, the final tunnel, is going to be the tunnel of the mantle of the presence of God and Holy Spirit. And who better to lead that than Chloe? <laughs> so if the ministry team could just jump up, we are going to, don't, actually don't do anything just yet. In a second, we're going to stand up and clear all of the middle chairs to the side, all of these chairs to the side and create loads of space. And then we're going to set the tunnels up. And we're going to start you at one end and you're just going to snake your way through, just like the check-in queue at the airport. We're going to snake your way through. So ministry team, once you've moved your chair, if you could jump up to the front. Okay, so ministry team, if you are in Stu and Chloe's fire group, if you're in mine and Abby's fire group, if you're in Alistair's fire group, Dan and Ashley's fire group, I think once you've been through the tunnel, you're welcome to come and join the tunnels if you're released on our team. <clears throat> so we're going to try and organize ourselves. Stu, where are you standing? Okay, so a small tunnel with Stu. Okay, for those of you who have no idea what a fire tunnel is, don't worry, we're not going to set you on fire in the natural We're going to set you on fire in the spiritual. Um, What we encourage you to do is just to walk through the tunnel. The point is receiving what God has for you in this time. So it's not what the body does, it's what the heart receives. Okay, we're just organizing ourselves. It's all right. 
So four, team, Sarah and Sam, I want four, four tunnels like this along, like that. So Stu's tunnel, Sarah and Sam's tunnel, Alistair's tunnel, closed tunnel. Okay. How many Catch the Fire leaders does it take to make four fire tunnels? Okay. We're good. Okay, so if everyone, if everyone just watches me for a second. Okay, so this is the start where I am, is the start of the tunnel, Stu and Dan. This is the identity tunnel. I'm going through the identity tunnel and I'm receiving fresh revelation of my identity in God. When I get here, I am traversing and I'm going through the tunnel of the Great Commission. And here I'm receiving fresh revelation about the work of the church, the body of Christ and the Great Commission. Okay. Okay. Alistair is the start of the mandate tunnel. This is about your calling and your election and your everything that God's calling you to do and calling you to be. And then the last tunnel, Chloe. Chloe, can you start your tunnel here? Is that all right? Okay. And then when you get to Chloe and her tunnel, Chloe and Philly. This is the last tunnel, okay? And as you walk through here, these guys are gonna get you good and roasted, the anointing, the presence, the Holy Spirit, the power, the Pentecost Sunday. And when you get to this bit, if you're still standing, congratulations, well done. Okay, so this is the queue here. We're gonna get started. Glaucia is gonna be first through. Okay, so everyone listen up, I'm gonna pray, and then we're gonna get started. Okay, so I'm gonna pray and then we'll get, we'll get started. Father God, we thank you. Shh. That was a good teacher voice, wasn't it? Father God, we thank you, first and foremost, that you are love, that you are good, that you are the Father from whom we get our identity, that the whole of heaven and earth is named after you, and we are part of your family. We are chosen, we are adopted, we are part of your family. We thank you for the identity that you bring us. Jesus, we thank you for your great commission that you charged us with to be co-laborers with you, to receive a call and a charge to change the world in your name, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that you appoint us to do specific things for you. Jesus, it's such a privilege to partner with you, to be a co-laborer with you for the glory of your name. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that as we walk this journey of life, you are the anointing, you are the flow you are the presence of God that equips us and empowers us. You are the grace of God to have the character of Jesus revealed to us, to have the, the revelation of sonship testified to us. Holy Spirit, we thank you. And we honor you today on Pentecost Sunday. We honor you that you fell and you changed forever what the church looked like. Can I get an amen for that?